faithwire.com. Hello and welcome to 4 and 3. This is the podcast breaking down four of the most important stories of the day and three things you need to know about them all from a Christian perspective. Today is Monday, March 22nd, 2021. I'm Dan Andros and coming up on the podcast today, the border crisis continues to worsen. Some stunning pictures and a leaked document show just how jam-packed migrants are in small facilities down there on the border. Actor Kevin Sorbo calls out Mark Zuckerberg over censorship. Uh, Curfews in Miami after video surface of big crowds and partying. Media says it's because of COVID, but that's only half the story, probably less than half the story. And Wheaton removes a plaque honoring martyred missionaries over, quote, offensive word, end quote. Joining me now to break all of this down is Trey Gones Phillips from faithwire.com. Trey, happy Monday to you, sir. Happy Monday. You know, I can't even believe that it's already like uh, spring break time I know. in Miami. I know. Uh, and where is the year going? I know. But at least there's some semblance of normalcy. We've got absolute chaos going on during spring break. I mean, that's usually, oh. that's a sign of the normal times, right? When at least it feels like 2019. It's not good, but. Yeah, yeah, it feels yeah. like 2019. Like it's it's not a net win to see young people being insane, but it's kind it's of normal. It's, it's in the it's a step in the right direction. And we're we're getting back to normal. All right, I'm just trying to find the positive here. All right, <laughs> we're in the, this crazy news cycle. I'm just trying to find a glimmer of hope. So that's right. All right, let's go to a serious topic to start. Story number one, big story of the day: the border crisis that you might not have really known about and if you watch regular mainstream news anyway um facilities uh, facilities down there on the border across the border continue to be overwhelmed with migrants who continue to flood to the borders uh here in america and mexico under the false belief that president biden will simply let them walk right in and become citizens uh in leaked documents obtained by axios uh, they found that 823 unaccompanied migrant children were held in Border Patrol custody for over 10 days. One facility in Donna, Texas, designed to hold 250 people, currently has over 3,000 migrants there. That's that what that stat was courtesy of NBC News. Uh, the maximum amount of time a, a child, keep in mind, is is legally supposed to be held there at the border is 72 hours. And they're there for 10 days. Uh, as of Saturday, 3,300 unaccompanied children had been in custody longer than that, with 2,226 of those for more than five days. Um, <clears throat> after a recent visit to the border, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy tweeted, I just left the border processing facility, hundreds of kids packed into open rooms. In a corner, I fought back tears as a 13-year-old girl sobbed uncontrollably, explaining through a translator how terrified she was having been separated from her grandmother and without her parents. For clarification, Murphy said in a follow-up tweet, kids are no longer being separated from their parents at the border. <laughs> uh, in this case, the girl's parents are in the U.S. But even though kids can now stay and apply for asylum, if they're traveling with relatives who aren't parents, the relative can't stay. So, so, they're, so they're separated kids. It's just... Under certain circumstances, they're okay with it. Yeah. Um, so what's the left saying here? Well, MSNBC's uh, Mehdi Hassan got into a tense exchange with Dan Crenshaw that pretty much summed up kind of the left and right fight on this. Uh, Mehdi was claiming that deportations have gone up under the Biden administration, trying to show that they've been tough on the border. But apparently he didn't factor into the equation that that number's up probably because of the sheer volume of people coming through the border. That's gone way up. So by necessity, deportations would have to be up unless they weren't deporting anyone. Uh, he also fixated on this point that Crenshaw, he kept saying Crenshaw uh, said Biden isn't deporting people, even though in the, own, in the clip he played in this exchange, Crenshaw didn't say that. What he said was that Biden had sent the message to migrants that they wouldn't be deported. And that's why they're flooding the border. So um, ABC News has this stunning clip, Trey, um, that kind of proved Crenshaw's point. Listen to what this migrant says. It's kind of hard to make out. They're translating it. But listen to what this migrant says. is a young woman who's with an even younger girl, presumably her child. 
Um, but listen to uh, what she says when asked about why they came. Él prometió que sí pasaba así con menores. Biden promised that we can cross with, with minors. She said... So if you caught that, he said, Biden said that we promised that we could cross with minors. So that was just an unprompted. They asked, why are you coming? That's what she said, because Biden yeah. promised it. So um, clearly, that is a message that is just spreading like wildfire throughout these communities down south and elsewhere, and people are coming. So so why does it matter? Well, you know, exchanges like that one on the news are frustrating because, you know, we want tough questions, and it's a complicated issue, but... If you watch that exchange, Crenshaw's trying to give you know his perspective on this thing, and this guy is just trying to get a viral clip. It was, he just kept fixating on this point, trying to say, "You're lying. Why are you lying yeah. about it?" And Crenshaw's like, "I'm not. I never said that." Um, so he obviously just wanted this moment of so and so catches Dan Crenshaw lying, blah blah blah. Um, so, but the fact of the matter is, the rhetoric from Biden has caused people to flood the border. I mean, that is just a fact. I mean, it's indisputable. You have people saying that. They're down there with Biden t-shirts. I mean, the whole thing. And it's now at a crisis level, and Biden clearly did not have a plan to deal with the massive influx of people. So this is incompetence at best, gross incompetence, intentional chaos at worst. So real lives are at stake here. And you know, if we truly care about these migrants... We wouldn't lie to them and cause them to take a risky journey at the hands of cartels. That's the other thing, Trey. Uh, yeah. These cartels are making money on both ends here. They're they're taking money to to um, you know be coyotes and smuggle these people in, and because they're flooding specific spots on the border, they can then run their drugs through other spots. So, um, just a horrible situation all around. Yeah, and I I wonder about the the moral argument uh, yeah. that so many Democrats made under uh, former President Trump about yep. how he was so immoral in his handling. Obviously, the child separation policy was a, a big one, uh, but then just his handling in general across the border with the wall, with uh, upping border security, border patrol security, all that uh, was just like trashed as immoral by the yeah. left. Uh I, and I just, I mean, certainly there are things that the Trump administration probably could have done better sure, uh, and could have handled better, like the child separation policy. There are things in that that could have been done better. I'm not arguing with that. But is it, I don't know that it's all that much, all that, you know, greater morally yeah. uh, to just let open the border and let people come and then literally be bursting at the seams with more people than we could possibly handle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that to me is is also a moral problem exactly and and um what this in this particular exchange that i feel like is a poster child example of kind of the debate um he kept saying well these they're deporting 70 percent of people but th that's not the point crenshaw was making you know th right the problem is not just the border it's the trek i mean the, they're having to go with these drug cartels to get there and they're these are dangerous journeys this is not like hey let's hop in an uber and go to the border I mean, this yeah. is life and death stuff. And so to your point, it is a moral issue of what we're doing beyond the border, where it starts before the border. So, you know, sending that message to people is very dangerous. And, um, and uh, you know, just because they're deporting a certain amount of people, that doesn't mean uh, that there's no harm, no foul here. Like, there, yeah. there's big problems. Yeah, for sure. Um, so story number two. Uh, actor, uh, Christian actor Kevin Sorbo, he's known for movies like God's Not Dead, What If, and Let There Be Light, uh, a few faith-based movies he's been in. He's also, in the 90s, he was in Hercules. Uh, he told me uh, last, late last week that he plans to look into how his Facebook page got deleted from the platform, calling the website's founder and CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, a big old wuss. <laughs> so, <laughs> a quote machine, <laughs> Kevin Sorbo. Yeah. So in, uh, in mid-February, Sorbo's Facebook account was uh, removed from the social media site. Facebook said at the time uh, that Sorbo's page was taken down because he shared what they described as quote-unquote debunked claims about COVID-19 and vaccinations. Uh, Sorbo, Sorbo told me, I'm going to look into it. I'm going to look into seeing what I can do about it because Zuckerberg to me is a big old wuss. I mean, this guy, he's a billionaire socialist, right? He doesn't look like a socialist. He's in a capitalist business. He flies around in private planes. He's got homes everywhere, and he can do whatever the heck he wants. <laughs> <laughs> not not bad points, I guess. Yeah. 
Uh, Sorbo also criticized the government's response to COVID-19, calling the mandates that are still in place uh, in many areas lunacy. Uh, he said, I had two movies lined up last year and about 16 speaking events uh, that all got canceled because of COVID. But I can get on an airplane and fly for five hours with a guy's shoulder right next to me. <laughs> but don't go to church, he said. It, uh, it makes no sense. Uh, so Sorbo's been uh, doing interviews to promote his new movie, The Girl Who Believes in Miracles, which is in theaters uh, this Easter week, coming Easter weekend. And he said, too, he doesn't really understand why Hollywood doesn't pay more attention to the millions of Americans who want family-friendly positive content because he said they're just losing money. That's yeah. an opportunity to make money uh, that, that they're not investing in. So what's left saying? Well, as far as the Facebook censor censorship stuff, social media outlets are pretty much run by the left. Uh, you know, certain kinds of censorship have been deemed okay if it protects other groups from being offended. Uh, so what's the right sign? Well, conservatives have obviously been very critical of any sort of cens censorship, really. Uh, and over the weekend, former President Trump, uh, who's been banned from practically every social media platform uh, <laughs> in existence, uh, announced that he plans to launch his own platform yeah. uh, in the next uh, several weeks. So that will certainly make many people in the media not very happy. <laughs> or very uh, happy because they'll be able very to fixate happy, yeah. on him again. Yeah, They'll have all kinds of stories to write about him because he will no doubt be posting things that will, 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 will cause attention, will bring attention to himself. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, I think the old saying uh, that the best response to bad speech is more speech yeah. is 100% true. Uh, because, you know, if history is any indication, uh, you know, when when a certain group who's in power uh, begins to restrict uh, what other people can say uh, and do, uh, it it ends up turning out badly, uh, and I yeah. you know I think I think it's going to end up being being bad for us in the long run. And I guess the the silver lining I, I thought about this, and and Ben Shapiro mentioned it too on his podcast uh, a few days ago. Dan is that if if we just let the the far left continue continue canceling people, the canceled and the people who are opposed to canceling will eventually <laughs> outnumber the people who are for canceling. Right? Yeah, we should just all get cancel ourselves and then like. It's like you emerge on the other side, you know, and you're it's like, oh, we made it through the, you know, the billowing <laughs> dust cloud and you just don't want to get canceled and you get to the other side and it's like, oh, uh, hey, everyone's yeah. all this, all this free speech over here. This is fun. Yeah, yeah. no, and I mean, it'll be a pretty diverse group, too, because yeah. it's not just conservatives who have been canceled. There's yeah. plenty of liberals who have been canceled. No, and you got you got to wonder at some point, is this. The fear of the mob, I, I feel like companies had done a good, relatively good job over the years of sort of shaking off the mob, you know, the Twitter yeah. mob and the social media mob and just kind of rolling their eyes going, all right, whatever, you know, we'll just let them be mad for a couple of days and move on dot com. But, um, you know, the, maybe they'll realize that it's not real. Like, yeah, there's some people out there and there might be some blue checks even, but most of them are activists that have got an axe to grind about something. Right. And but then the rest of them are all just I mean, who are you responding to? It's just people with nothing better to do. Egg accounts on on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, you're just taking this lock stock, you know, taking that to the bank. I, I don't understand the need to bow to that mob because it's not like it's, you know, credible in any sort of way. Um, yeah. It's And I think, you know, one of the other things that I don't understand why people don't that people don't realize is that a lot of these people who are jumping on board to cancel somebody uh, are, are really just doing it because they see that person, the person who everybody's now supposed to hate as just a stepping stool for yeah. them yeah. to become more well-known, to be more famous, to get more attention, more interviews on cable news. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, they're just using them to, to make themselves better and more popular, which to me, I just think like shame on you because eventually they're going to come for you too. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then and then what are you going to do? You yeah. know? Yeah. And by then, the, it's just the very too late. system yeah. that you propped up is going to cancel you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you watch like Teen Vogue. I don't know anything about that girl who was 27 years old and set to be the editor in chief, but dug up some old tweets where she made used racist language and, um, you know, and now she's done. So congrats yeah. on your cancel culture there. Um, young people, you know, a lot of them sort of driving that. But uh, 
Yeah. You know, and it's you're just going to start eating your own. Any mistake you make, and it's unforgivable. You know, you're not, right. I mean, she was like 15 years old when she did it. And, you know, <laughs> now she's getting, you know, losing a job over that. So um, yeah. pretty, pretty and remarkable after stuff. A, a, after a good career. So, you know, so far right. she was at Axios as a reporter. She's in her late 20s, moved up to Teen Vogue. And like you said, none of that matters because nope. of tweets she posted more than a decade ago. Right. And I mean, gosh, I mean, you think about. I mean, me, I grew up obviously in the before the digital era there, my high school year. I mean, you think all the dumb things you said and did, if, if it was all online somewhere, I mean, we'd all be canceled. I mean, it's so ridiculous. It's it's yeah. beyond ridiculous. A graceless culture. But yeah. Oh, man. Well, let's move on to story number three, Trey. And we've got some craziness. The spring yeah, break craziness that we talked about. Um, you might have saw the headlines that... Um, you know, showing crowded beaches in Miami and talking about a curfew being out there related to COVID. You know, a few examples, New York Post had one, Miami extends 8 p.m. curfew in COVID-19 spring break crackdown. Uh, looks like BBC had one, COVID-19, Miami Beach imposes emergency curfew uh, over spring break chaos. Miami Beach, this is from Reuters, clash with spring break crowds to enforce emergency COVID order. Now, that they notice that they attach COVID to all those. Well, that's only really a small part of the story. Um, yeah. And maybe they're just, it's just only because they're able to have that curfew because of COVID. But the videos that are surfacing are sh it's because of the violence. I mean, like it's just pure chaos. There, you know, um, there's a few good threads out there. I'm going to quote from one of them from from a user named Mr. Commodity, um, who has a <laughs> it's a ridiculous name, but he's got a sizable following. So. <laughs> Um, you know, but then an actual, and there's actual video videos posts. So this is not, you know, hearsay. Um, but, the, but you, you just see these cr crowds just, um, you know, ri uh, I don't know to say rioting, but they were fighting, uh, having a, having a brawl, I guess is the better word. Yeah. Um, on the outside seating section of restaurants, just tumbling over tables, you know, mm -hmm. breaking everything, throwing glasses and plates and the tables are falling, chairs are flying. People are getting beat up and, uh. And then they all leave, destroy the place, and no one pays their bill. At one, they said at least two thousand dollars worth of bills just not paid. Wow. Um, and and that was just one, a couple of groups that were there. Um, Miami Beach Mayor Dan Gelber uh, said that too many people are coming here right now. Our city in this area has become a quote tinder, and we can't have a policy of simply hoping it's not lit. Um, that Twitter user I mentioned, Mister Commodity. Uh, tweeted this the fights are constant every day and night at least two or three involve shootings mind you this is a 10 block uh by three block area and that was accompanied by one of the restaurants getting destroyed uh there was more footage showing another restaurant getting trashed and and a, and a guy just beating the snot out of several women um and so he's he, so this user adds this is why miami beach issued a state of emergency H had nothing to do with covid and 100% to do with this type of nightly behavior. Um, he also pointed out that last year, the NAACP called the Miami police racist for patrolling the spring break crowds. And apparently, apparently this is what happens when they let up. Maybe they're not uh, enforcing it as much this year. We'll get the reports on that if they come out at a later date. But um, uh, And then he also added, second and more importantly, a complete and lack of foresight and planning by elected officials like Mayor Dan Gelber. Uh, they spent more time last year on CNN complaining about DeSantis <laughs> than taking care of their own house. And um, and he said cities get the leaders they deserve. Miami deserves better. Um, at least 1,000 arrests, more than half of them from out of town. Uh, and um, they brought in, Trey, uh, officers from at least four other agencies, including SWAT teams, to help try to contain the crowds. But it still wasn't enough. Um, so they're looking at restaurants shutting down at 8 p.m. for this curfew um, and during this three-day emergency period and encouraging local businesses to voluntarily shut down. Just just don't even deal with it. Because another one of the videos, Trey, was just um, seeing a guy, the, the waiters are having to chase down people fleeing these. They're just like leaving and not paying their bills. And uh, yeah. he's, they, there's, he's on video, this guy chasing down someone and tackling him. He's, he's a waiter in his... You know, you can see he's got his, you know, waiter gear on. And, um, and yeah, it's just crazy. It's crazy. They're out there having to tackle people to get them to pay bills. 
Um, yeah. So just, just wild stuff. But it's interesting because the media sort of really attached that to COVID, but it seems to not really be why they had to do that. Yeah. Well, on the, on the View today, they were talking about it being a, this massive super spreader event, and uh, the police are only targeting minorities, which I don't know <laughs> no. that there's any sort of truth. Of the, 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 I don't know where they got that information from. Uh, it seems like it's just a bunch of stupid kids yeah. being being dumb and being violent. So the police are just, you know, trying to play whack-a-mole. Yeah, um, I mean, how can you? Yeah, go ahead. The the thing that's so dumb to me or frustrating is that uh, apparently some of the co-hosts on The View are like, well, you know, DeSantis should have left COVID restrictions in place because then this wouldn't be happening. <laughs> it's like, I... I one, the kids still had spring break last year, if we remember, yeah. and it was a big deal and everybody was angry about it. So I don't think that COVID restrictions were going to stop <laughs> them from going. Yeah. And two, I thought the restrictions were to help stop COVID, not to right. stop <laughs> this kind of rioting right. or, or brawling. I would uh, like, so, yeah. I yeah. Know. If I owned a restaurant there, Dan, I would have just boarded up and left. It's not worth the money no. for the week. It's not worth it. And then, I mean, the, they might not even pay. It sounds like they're just going to leave. Yeah. Which do you know which view host said that? Are you do, did they say? No, I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll have to go back and look because I'd love to hear that thought fleshed out. Like that's one of those things that it feels like something you say before you actually think. Because yeah. <laughs> because because, yeah, like. What are you implying there? That the country needs more lockdowns and everywhere to stop people from brawling? I mean, that yeah. seems uh, that seems to be like a chicken and the egg sort of thing, or a little bit to- yeah. totalitarian for for my taste. <laughs> yeah. So. And it, it doesn't sound like a good idea. It's a, a slippery slope that I don't think will end no. too well. No, no, absolutely not. So story number four, administrators at Wheaton College, which is, of course, uh, the Christian uh, university or college in Illinois, uh, have removed a plaque uh, commemorating the deaths of a group of martyred missionaries because the memorial used the word savage to describe the indigenous tribe who violently killed them. Uh, Now some people are are quite upset about the use of the word savage. So college officials uh, said they'll be commissioning a task force to review the language on the plaque. Uh, which honored uh, James Elliott and Ed McCulley, two missionaries uh, of four, or of five total, I'm sorry, uh, who are part of a group working to spread the gospel to indigenous peoples in Ecuador, uh, according to the outlet, The Spectator. Uh, Wheaton President Philip Riken uh, announced in an email last Wednesday that the plaque was being removed and would be replaced eventually with a new one. Uh, recently, students, faculty, and staff have expressed concern about the language on the plaque that is now recognized as offensive, he wrote. Uh, Specifically, the word savage is regarded as pejorative and has been used historically to dehumanize and mistreat indigenous peoples around the world. So the group of missionaries uh, that went uh, in the the 50s uh, spent months building a relationship with the Wadani, I I think that's how you say it, tribe uh, in the rainforests of Ecuador. Uh, They exchanged several gifts uh, before they ever met in person. Uh, then they eventually met in person face to face and the, the meeting was considered a success by the missionaries. Uh, but then on January 8th, 1956, uh, the tribe speared to death five missionaries, uh, including McCulley and Elliot, and threw uh, all five of their bodies into a nearby river. Uh, to honor the lives of the slain missionaries, the class of 1949 at Wheaton gifted the plaque to the college in 1957, just one year later. Uh, the other murdered missionaries were named Nate, Nate Saint, Peter Fleming, and Roger uh, Udarian. So what's the left saying? Well, those on the left seem to have been the ones who were most concerned about the use of the word savages. Uh, so this response from Wheaton uh, is, is kind of in response to the left. Uh, and what's the right saying? Well, there hasn't been much talk specifically about this. Uh, some, though, likely don't see it as that big of a deal, while others uh, certainly see it as as kind of whitewashing uh, a not-too-distant past. Yeah. Uh, so why does it matter? Well, the president's email said that, uh, you know, the plaque will come back, it'll be reworded, and it will still, quote, honor the brave missionaries and their sacrificial witness, while at the same time respecting the Wudani people. Uh, but I think the concern, much like removing statues, is that, you know, eliminating the, the vestiges of our past uh, is is really an effort without an end goal, uh, because when would when would it end? What would be appropriate enough to remain up? Yeah, uh, you know the tribe members at the time did spear those five people to death. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a brutal and violent murder, uh, and, and their bodies were then tossed into a river. Uh, that kind of murder would be savage no matter who committed yeah. it. Uh, so we seem to have just, you know, we're ripping history entirely from its context. Uh, you know, I do, though, like uh, one of the missionaries' granddaughters, Valerie, said, I hope that the media attention on this story sparks more interest maybe uh, in the, the, I mean, incredible work. Uh, that these five missionaries did to spread the gospel, because apparently uh, this tribe in Ecuador, uh, indigenous tribe in Ecuador, had never heard the gospel. They'd never been reached with the gospel or been evangelized to it all before these five people tried. Yeah. Uh, and several of them, according to to some reports, went on to become Christians. Even the one who murdered uh, or is believed to have murdered the five missionaries, he's reportedly converted to Christianity later in his life. Yeah. And uh, and um, if I'm not mistaken, Trey, this is one of those tribes that really didn't have a lot of contact with outside human civilization, right? Yeah, I, no. I, I'm trying, vague, I'm trying to remember the story. I haven't read it in a while. Um, yeah. uh, of Jim Elliot, but um, but I'm looking up the definition of savage here, Trey, and it says lacking the restraints normal to civilized um, human beings. Now, you know, if they're living in a you know culture that's removed from most other human beings on the planet. And doing things like spearing someone that just comes for a visit, um, <laughs> I would think the definition yeah. applies, you know? I mean, sometimes the truth hurts, you know? If that's how they were living, that, you know, they, they clearly didn't see a problem with just killing someone um, for no real reason, you know? Yeah. Um, so it seems like it would fit, but to your point about taking away the plaque, I mean, this plaque, I mean, that's a piece of history there. Um you yeah. know that they gave as a gift at that time, right when it happened, and so to yeah, yeah. To, to like you said, I mean it's it, it is potentially whitewashing that, and um, you know getting away. I mean, because then what would your logic be for trying to explain this story to someone? Well, why did they kill him? Well, they just this had a difference of opinion or something. I, I don't know. Well, they were fighting on Twitter. Like what? What would be the argument? What would be the reason? You know, no, they yeah. were a savage tribe at that point in time. Is a is a more accurate definition. Uh, I would think. I mean, again, I'm speaking just off of vague memory of um, them being an uncivilized group of people. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know what the new plaque is going to say, but it's important, I think, to to recognize and to, to remember uh, that these five missionaries, uh, they didn't just die sharing the gospel. They were brutally oh. murdered sharing the gospel. By so it's, spear. you know, it's what an incredible sacrifice that they gave, yeah. uh, you know, their life. Uh, for for sharing the gospel. And I think if we just, like I said, ripping all of this context out of our history, we're losing so much of its complexity that makes it so important. Yeah, and I would love to hear the testimony of those um, from the tribe that were saved. I wonder now if they would look back and describe themselves as savage. You know, a lot of people in their own testimonies, Trey, you know, look back at their life before they were saved and say, man, I was wretched, you know, and I'm still a sinner. You know, you don't, absolved of sins that you do but when you look back at if you were unhinged you know you weren't even trying to 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 follow christ i think we would have some choice words to say about our own lives before then so i'd be interested to see if anyone knows of the (laughs) of how those um former you know those tribe members that now became christians would describe themselves that that could be interesting to see That, that would be uh maybe a good way for them to go when they're they're going on this new plaque. What were the words that they used to describe themselves? So, mm, yeah, I guess uh, I guess time will tell. But all right, that is all the time we have for today. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your Monday. We'll be back here uh, with more stories from a Christian perspective. Everything going on in the news. Um, make sure to follow us on YouTube and um, over on FaithWire.com, CBNNews.com, and uh, we'll be back here tomorrow. God bless you. <laughs>